Hello, hello. Welcome to the Micro Discovery Project's live author hangout. I'm James Ockenden, a volunteer in Hong Kong, and your host for this fundraising event. Thank you for joining. We have a very special guest with us today, Elizabeth Tober Bailey, the author of the much-loved book, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, James. Very glad to be here. Great, great, great. So Elizabeth will be reading from her book and answering your questions from her home in Maine, USA. We also have Vanessa in London monitoring the emails in case you would like to ask questions. Email them to microdiscovery at gmail.com and we'll try to put them to Elizabeth. This is the first of four live sessions with Elizabeth this weekend. She has kindly agreed to do unique live readings to cover every time zone from Auckland to Oslo, both US coasts. And of course, you're very welcome to come back and enjoy the other sessions too. Before Elizabeth reads, let me just recap while we're here. Your donations today will support the Microbe Discovery Project. This is an initiative pioneered by MECF patients in support of Dr. Ian Lipkin's research into this disease. Dr. Lipkin is a world-renowned scientist, well known for his work on SARS, for example, here in Hong Kong, uh, the current Ebola outbreak, of course, and the MECFS community are very lucky to have him working on MECFS research as well. The patient group has already raised more than 150,000 US dollars, um, but we need more funds to move Dr. Lipkin's research forward. To donate during or after the show, please see the links on this page, uh, the Google Plus page. And remember, 100% of your donation goes directly to Columbia University, earmarked for Dr. Lipkin's MECFS research project. So now, for Elizabeth's reading for this session, Wild Snail Discovery. So it's over to you, Elizabeth. Hello, I'm delighted to be here to give the series of four readings, one tonight and three tomorrow, all over 24 hours to hit all the time zones, as James just explained. I fully support Dr. Lipkin's microbe discovery project research. It holds so much potential for CFS and ME, and it brings patients hope each day. For this first session here tonight, I'm going to read from part one of my book, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. I'll read a bit, answer some questions, read a bit more, and end with some last questions this evening. For those of you who don't know this true story, during one bedridden year with MECFS, a friend came to visit and brought a wild forest snail she had found in the woods. She left it in a flower pot by my bedside, and I ended up observing this snail for a full year. I'm going to start by reading from part one, the violet part, excuse me, part one, the violet pot adventures. Chapter two, discovery. Throughout the evening, the snail explored the sides of the pot and the dish beneath. Its leisurely pace was mesmerizing. I wondered if it would wander off during the night. Perhaps I'd never see it again, and the snail problem would simply vanish. But when I woke the next morning, the snail was back up in the pot, tucked into its shell, asleep beneath a violet leaf. The night before, I had propped an envelope containing a letter against the base of the lamp. Now I noticed a mysterious square hole just below the return address. This was baffling. How could a hole, a square hole, appear in an envelope overnight? Then I thought of the snail and its evening activity. The snail was clearly nocturnal. It must have some kind of teeth, and it wasn't shy about using them. It dawned on me that perhaps the snail needed some real food. Letters and envelopes were probably not its typical diet. A few long-gone flowers were in a vase by my bed. One evening, I put some of the withered blossoms in the dish beneath the pot of violets. The snail was awake. It made its way down the side of the pot and investigated the offering with great interest and then began to eat one of the blossoms. A petal started to disappear at a barely discernible rate. I listened carefully. I could hear it eating. The sound was of someone very small munching celery 
continuously. I watched transfixed <clears throat> as over the course of an hour the snail meticulously ate an entire purple petal for dinner. The tiny intimate sound of the snail's eating gave me a distinct feeling of companionship and shared space. For several weeks, the snail lived in the flower pot just inches from my bed, sleeping beneath the violet leaves by day and exploring by night. Each morning while I was having breakfast, it climbed back into the pot to sleep in the little hollow it had made in the dirt. Though the snail usually slept through the days, it was comforting to glance toward the violets and see its small circular shape tucked under a leaf. Each evening the snail awoke and with astonishing poise it moved gracefully to the rim of the pot and peered over, surveying once again the strange country that lay ahead, pondering its circumstance with a regal air as if from the turret of a castle. It waved its tentacles first this way and then that, as though responding to a distant melody. James, do you have a few questions for me? Yes, I do. Thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. That's lovely. Um, so I guess the first question is, and maybe you addressed it in the reading, but um, the, the, the title of your book, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating, I mean, where does that come from? Is it really a noisy thing to, uh, to listen to? It is. Um, the first time I heard, heard this snail eat, I had fed it some violet petals from the violet plant that it was living in, the, in this violet pot, um, flower pot with violets in it, and it was, and I, I took some of the petals actually from the vase and put them down there, and the snail began to eat them, and I could actually hear the sound. I was in a very quiet room. There was no refrigerator humming or computer humming, and I was astonished that I could hear that sound. A snail actually has, this particular species has 2,642 teeth. So even though it's only about an inch big, it has an enormous number of teeth, and it makes a little teeny grating sound when it eats. Wow. Now, actually, that, that sound is uh, on your website, so that's lovely. And maybe we'll play it later. Um, people can hear that uh, crazy sound. So uh, another question uh, came in. What, what was it that intrigued you about the snail, and what caused you to start watching it so closely? Well, I was in a, you know, I was stuck in bed and there was nothing moving in the room at all. And the snail kind of came out of a sh its shell and started to glide around. So I just found myself, well, I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I started to watch it. And it was sort of, it was just interesting because it was clearly exploring. It was clearly curious about where it was. Mm -hmm. And as I watched it over a few days, it became clear it had routines. It would go back to the flower pot every morning and sleep all day, and at night it would wake up and go off and have adventures. Mm. So was that the idea that this little creature had routines just like a human, that kind of really intrigued me. Right, right. So you became fascinated watching its habits. Um, okay, do you, do you think the snail ever acknowledged your existence? You were watching him or it? That's a really interesting question, and I, snails have three senses, touch, taste, and smell. They can't hear at all, and they have very limited sight. And smell really is very important, and I, I, it, it was in a house for the first time in its life, and so it must have had a lot of unusual smells around it. Mm. And I'm sure that it had some sense of the smell of a human because I was only a few feet away. So I suspect that it knew there was some creature there. It might not, it certainly didn't know what kind, but... Mm. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> were, were, were you surprised to find yourself drawn to uh, such a small, uh, slimy creature? Um, how, how did other people, like your visitors in, uh, when, you were, when you were sick, how did they react to, having, to you having a snail in your bedroom? Um, they were kind of amused, I think. You know, it's hard when you're really ill. Um, you don't want to always talk about illness, and the people visiting you don't always want to talk about illness. And I think that it was wonderful in a way because we could all talk about the snail. My friends would call and say, you know, how's the snail? And I'd be able to recount its latest adventures. Um, and my caregiver 
also was help you know helped feed it. So it it was really good because I think it kind of gave everybody a, a focus in what otherwise is a sort of a sick room. So it, it worked really well. Right. In right. Fact, mm. I think I'd like to read a few passages about illness at this point. Yes. Okay. You go ahead and read uh, read some more then. Great. Okay. This is from the chapter titled Explorations. Each morning there was a moment before I had fully awakened when my mind still groped its clumsy way back to consciousness, my body not yet remembered, reality not yet acknowledged. That moment was always full of pure, sweet, uncontrollable hope. I did not ask for this hope to come. I did not even want it, for it trailed disappointment in its wake. Yet there it was, hovering within me, hope that my illness had vanished with the night and my health had returned magically with daybreak. But that moment always passed. My eyes opened and reality flooded in. Nothing had changed at all. Then I thought of the snail. I'd look for it, the tiny earth-colored creature. Usually it was back up in the flower pot asleep, its familiar shape reminding me that I wasn't alone. My friends had so little time that I often wished I could give them what time I could not use. It was perplexing how, in losing health, I had gained something so coveted but to so little purpose. I eagerly awaited visitors, but the anticipation and the extra energy of greetings caused a numbing exhaustion. As the first stories unfolded, my spirit held on to the conversation as best it could. I so wanted these connections to the outside world, but my body sank beneath waves of weakness. Still, my friends were golden threads randomly appearing in the monotonous fabric of my days. Each visit was a window that opened momentarily into the life I had once known, always falling shut before I could make my way back through. The visits were like dreams from which I awoke once more alone. Given its tiny footprint, a snail had plenty of territory in the terrarium to survey in minute detail, finding endless nooks and crannies of interest. I, on the other hand, rarely moved beyond the familiar section of my sheets. Occasionally, when the snail slept and an urgent need for change, no matter the cost, swept through me, I would slowly roll from my right side over to my left side. This simple act caused my heart to beat wildly and erratically, but the reward was a whole new vista. The other side of the room was spread out before me like a map with countless possibilities of faraway adventures, including the most tantalizing of things, a window and a door. Was this truly a door that I would someday open and walk through, as if walking out into the world were an ordinary thing to do? I would look at the door until it reminded me of all the places I could not go. Then exhausted and empty from my audacious adventure, I'd make the slow roll back toward the kingdom of the terrarium and the tiny life it contained. I think that's a, a good represent, representation of what um, severe chronic fatigue syndrome is like and uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis. It's hard to say. <laughs> Yes, um, I mean that's that's one question that's come in is that um, you know how it's quite a rehabilitating illness. How did you manage to write a book and get this uh, published with NECFS? It was very difficult. It was a very slow process. Um, the book took four years to write. It's only thirty thousand words, which is very short for a book. Mm. And uh, you know, a great deal of it was accomplished horizontally, lying down. I do all my reading and editing lying down, and I have to hold things up above my head to read. Um, I can't really read on my side well, and so I would Xerox the pages that I needed to, to read carefully because the Xeroxes are, are lighter, and I am very dependent on astronaut pens because they can write upside down. Nice. So I have a whole stash of those pens right by my day bed. Um, so whenever I finished a draft, I could lie down with an astronaut pen and mark it up lying, lying down. Um, so it was very difficult, and the only thing really that got me through was 
it was a, a book about a snail, and I figured no matter how long it took, that was in keeping with how slowly a snail moved, how slowly a ME CFS patient um, moves through life. Yeah. So the snail really kept me going through that process. Yeah. That's great. That's good advice for writers who want to work lying down. Ask them all that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Do you think, I mean, do you think you could ever have observed a snail so closely in the sort of detail that you, you talk about in your book if you hadn't if you hadn't been ill or bedridden? I don't think so. I I think that I was living in sort of a non human time um, you know, level of movement. I really was actually almost below the snail's activity level. It could putter around and have adventures and I couldn't even do that. So I was actually below snail level when I started watching it and then there was a point when I got a little bit better and I was sort of faster than snail level and there were more things I could do and then I spent less time watching it so I don't think I could ever have written this book if I had been healthy mm. and a snail had come into my life. Okay, okay. And um, so so what to what extent do you think the snail's uh, companionship help your help your health, your physical health, your mental health? I think it helped, um, you know, because for a couple of reasons. One, it gave me there was somebody else alive in the room with me, twenty four seven. That was huge. Um, when you're all mostly alone, twenty four seven for months and months at a time, it's really helpful to have a living creature around, and that was wonderful. And it was also a creature that didn't need a lot of care from me, like a dog or a cat. I really wasn't well enough even to care for a dog or a cat at that point. And then also, um, I got curious about it, so it made me interested in another animal species, and it gave me a focus. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, mentioned earlier, um, something to talk to friends and family about during some some time periods that were really, I really was pretty incapacitated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you think we have time for one more question, or do you think uh, we can ask? Sure. You? Okay. Uh, do you think so? Do you think other people uh, in a similar situation would benefit from having? Um, you mentioned a cat or a dog is perhaps not a good idea, but uh, benefit from having some sort of animal, uh, care animal as company. Yes, I do. I think um, it's always good to have an animal. I think you just are more aware of the world and how another creature is um, living in in the same world, and I, it just adds a whole good dimension to life, whether you're healthy or ill, but especially if you're ill and can't be doing other things. Right, right. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it's lovely. I mean, have you ever kept any other animals uh, since then, similar? I've usually always had a cat or a dog or both. I am momentarily between cats, though, so <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have a cat and a dog again. Okay. Just for the view. Uh, okay. Well, I think, I think that's for this first session. Um, I think we are out of time. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, for, for that. We will actually, we're doing four of these sessions, as we said. So I hope you'll be able to join us later um, to the viewers. Our next one is tomorrow, in 12 hours from, from now, and then two more after that the same day. So three sessions tomorrow. Yeah, so the two, the two sessions later, I think we've got one coming up on uh, snail tentacles. Uh, we've got one on a snail romance, which will be uh, very interesting. So um, thank you very much for coming and watching this uh, live Google Hangout for the Microbe Discovery Project. Uh, this is supporting a fundraiser for Dr. Lipkin at Columbia University. If you haven't had a chance to donate to this important ME CFS research, please do so on the uh, Columbia University link on the screen. Uh, thank you very much, and hopefully we'll see you in 12 hours. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye.